So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this Wednesday. Um, we're going to be presenting Renters Count, the Apartment Industry and the 2020 Census. My name is Amy Groff. I'm the Senior Vice President of Industry Operations for the National Apartment Association. And I recognized that all of our members were gearing up for the 2020 census, which kicks off soon. Well, it's probably already underway, but the official kickoff is in April. Um, and I know that I was receiving a lot of questions from members, so I thought it would be great to get a group together um, to talk about the census and how we can partner with the census and make sure we're set up for success to count all of our winners next year. So thank you for joining us. Um, we will be recording this um, and we will be posting um, this webinar recording on the National Apartment Association webpage. We have a webpage dedicated to the 2020 census. On that webpage, you'll find a lot of resource, resources for you, including a frequently asked questions resource, which we'll touch on today, um, and a host of um, marketing collateral and uh, resources that we've obtained from our partner, the US Census. So please check out our webpage and that's where you'll be able to find the recording of this webinar. Um, and then also I wanted to point out that we do have a chat box available for you um, on this webinar. So we welcome all questions and comments. We want to make sure that you walk away from this webinar with all of your questions answered. So please utilize the chat box and we'll make sure to at some point take a breath and answer any questions that may arise. So feel free to utilize that. Today I'd like to present um, a couple panelists for you. Um, this morning we have Kale Ballard. Bauer. She is the Chief of Integrated Partnership and Communications Branch within the Decennial Directorate at the U.S. Census Bureau. That's a mouthful. In this position, Kale is responsible for the strategic, st strategic planning and management of the federal government's largest civic engagement campaign, the Integrated Partnership and Communications, or IPC, operation for the 2020 Census. Also uh, welcome Donna Ashton and Ted Papadopoulos, partners of the Winchester law firm Ashton Law PC. They specialize in the representation of large and small property management firms and real estate owners in all of their landlord tenant related ma matters, including but not limited to the development of properties, leasing and eviction actions. So welcome to our panelists and thank you for being with us today. So I'd like to get started. Um, we've got a lot of great information for you all today um, and Kale is gonna kick it off for us right now. Kale? Great, thank you, Amy. Um, okay. Am I controlling the screen? Uh, I can control it. Um, just okay. let me know when you're ready to yep. move forward. There you go. All right, so I'm gonna have a start off with our newly released public service announcement called our 2020 Census Made Simple. So take a look, Amy, if you wanna press play for me. services. That's why the census is used by the government to inform funding decisions each year. But that's not all. It's also used by nonprofits to inform services, by businesses to create jobs, and even by students for school projects. Understanding how the population changes helps us shape communities across the country for the better. How does the 2020 census affect representation? There are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. These get distributed to the 50 states by population, and an accurate census response helps your state get the right amount of seats. States with smaller populations get at least one, while states with larger populations might get more. How do I take the 2020 census? In March 2020, every address in the country will receive an invitation to complete a simple questionnaire. And there are three ways to respond. 
Number one, do it online. Number two, call by phone. Number three, send it by mail. For those who don't respond, a census taker from your community will follow up and assist you. Is my 2020 census data safe? After sending your census response, your personal information is kept safe. By law, it can't be shared with any other government agency, law enforcement, or landlord. No one. So take your 2020 census with peace of mind. Shape your future and start here. Visit 2020census.gov. All right. Thank you. So if you want to go to the next slide. So that's one of many Sorry. public. No worries. Sure. That's one of many public service announcements that we now have up on our website that partners or just the general public can go on and use. Um, we encourage everyone to share those via your social media. So Facebook, Instagram, all of that to help us get the word out about the census. Now, while the 2020 census is simple, as you can see in that video, it also faces a myriad of challenges. With 2020, we, it brings a constrained fiscal environment. We see rapid changes in technology as have happened over the past 10 years. We've seen an explosion of data and information. We've also found a growing distrust in government and declining response rates to surveys. The United States has an increasingly diverse population and we see more informal and complex living arrangements. We also are dealing with a growing mobile population. Next slide, please. But despite these challenges, the goal of the 2020 census is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. To do this, we have five basic steps. You want to click one? So first, we start out by figuring out where people live. Amy, you might want to click through like the next couple. Um, this decade, we did this through a combination of in-office work and field work. So for the majority of addresses, we were looked in the office setting and looked at satellite imagery and address files that were provided to us by state, tribal, and local governments. And we put those together to see if there was change happening on the ground. We then used those administrative records and geographic information to verify addresses across the nation. There were a percentage of those, though, that we just couldn't do in the office. Either the satellite imagery that we had was not clear, we did not receive address lists from the local governments, or there was simply too much change happening in the housing stock in those local areas. So for those households, we sent census takers out into the field in our first major census operation for 2020. We kicked it off in August, and we just wrapped it up about a month ago. Now, once we have figured out where people are, we need to motivate them to respond. We do this primarily through the operation that I'm responsible for, the Integrated Partnership and Communications Operation. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail on that later, so we'll hold that one. Once we motivate people and get them excited about the census, explain to them why they should do it, we want them to self-respond. For 2020, this is the first sentence, census, census that allows people to self-respond online, through, by the phone, or through the mail. Now, even making it easy for people to respond, we know that not everyone will. So for those households that do not respond by the beginning of May, we will send census takers out into the field to assist those households. Now, it's important to recognize, though, even though you will see census takers in May, June, and July, you can still self-respond on the, the other three modes, so online, by phone, or by mail. Now, once we've collected all that data, it's then time to tabulate the results. The first dissemination of our data will occur on December 31st, 2020, when we deliver the apportionment counts to the president. Those are the numbers that determine how many representatives each state will get in Congress. Following that, on a rolling basis, we will provide data to each of the states so that by March 31st of 2021, every state will have their redistricting data. Following that, we will release multiple different data products on a rolling basis as we develop them. Okay, next slide. So with the introduction 
of the Internet Self Response for 2020, we're able to provide the Internet questionnaire in multiple languages, available on demand for respondents. Online and phone responses are available in English and the 12 non-English languages seen here. And our paper form is available in Spanish and English. Our census questionnaire assistance or our phone response also provides support with a telecommunication device for the deaf or a TDD option. Next slide. Additionally, we'll provide support materials in 59 languages, which expands our support to over 99% of the language needs in the country. We have language guides both in video and print. We have language glossaries and language identification cards. In these 59 languages that you see here, but also including American Sign Language, Braille, and large print. We are also providing shelves and templates of these guides, glossaries, and cards to help individuals, such as community leaders or language experts, to support their communities that speak other languages or dialects that we may not be covering. Next slide. So the 2020 Census is important. The distribution of over $675 billion in federal funding every year is based upon this once a decade count. This money is spent by states and localities on things such as schools, hospitals, roads, public works, and other vital programs. And as I said, every 10 years, the results of this census are used to reapportion the House of Representatives, determining how many seats each state gets. The decennial census also provides an important baseline for hundreds of other surveys taken across the nation in the next 10 years. Next slide. The census, 2020 census is easy. It's easier than ever. In 2020, you have the option of responding online, by phone, or by mail. And you can respond from any time, at any time from anywhere using a mobile device. And if submitting your information over the internet is not comfortable for you, you can always respond by phone or mail. And finally, if you don't self-respond, we will send that census taker to assist you. Next slide. The 2020 census is also safe. All responses will be confidential and all census employees are sworn for life to protect your information. Your personally identifiable information cannot be shared with anyone, including other government agencies, local law enforcement, or even landlords. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we have a general idea about the 2020 census. Let's talk about IPC. The Integrated Partnership and Communications Operations job is to motivate people to respond on their own and to work with partners to promote the 2020 census and encourage response. We are committed to making data-driven decisions based on research and testing. Now, prior to 2000, the communication efforts of the Bureau relied solely on public service announcements, which proved to be ineffective at reversing the industry-wide decline in survey response rate. So, for the 2000 Census, the Bureau implemented a paid advertising campaign and a comprehensive partnership program. In 2010, we implemented a communications and partnership program with, that was even broader than 2000. And for 2020, we are repeating that model from the past, but infusing it with modern approaches using social media, digital advertising, and advertising targeted to specific audiences. To encourage self-response, we're working with a major advertising fir firm, Young & Rubicam, on a national advertising and outreach campaign. In 2020, this will include social media advertising, a dynamic website, stories you'll see on the local news, commercials, both on TV and radio, special programs with schools that educate teachers and students who then can go home and remind their parents to fill out the census and why it's important to do so, and so much more. Next slide, please. So research has had a role before, during, and after the implementation of our communications campaign. Generally speaking, as you can see here, early research created audience segments, informed our creative development, and was used to develop audience-specific strategies. Our in-campaign research will contribute to an optimized and efficient program 
by incorporating real-time information as much as possible. And then after execution is complete, our research staff remain active with assessments and evaluations. And our executive and experts, are, their review is accounted for through every stage of our process. Next slide. Now, because of our commitment to testing, we traveled literally across the continental United States to Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico to ensure that our communication materials resonated with everyone and did not offend. Here you can see where the testing has taken us. We've pretty much covered the entire United States. I can tell you my suitcase and my husband can attest to that. <laughs> Next slide. So we started with our census barriers, attitudes, and motivator study, or we affectionately call it CBAMS. The purpose of CBAMS was to understand the attitudes people had toward the census, the barriers that may inhibit participation, and what would motivate them to respond. This research was used to inform and inspire our creative strategy and partner outreach. So by conducting a quantitative survey and qualitative focus groups, our research team sought to answer four different questions. Who intends to respond to the census? Where do gaps in knowledge about the census exist? What barriers prevent people from completing the census? And what's going to motivate people to respond? We found a general lack of knowledge about the scope, purpose, and constitutional foundation of the census. People just don't understand what the census is or why it's important. But we also saw five high-level barriers. We saw apathy and lack of efficacy. We saw privacy and confidentiality concerns. We saw distrust in government with few perceived personal benefits. And new this time around, we saw a fear of repercussions that we hadn't seen in past censuses. But one shining star came out of this. We weren't expecting it, but we saw, found a motiva motivator that ex went across all of our groups. And that was that if we can inform the public about the importance of the census and how exactly mm. our census results are used to help their communities, they are more likely to respond. So our, our messaging has to do three things. We need to connect census participation to support to local communities to address, to address that apathy and lack of efficacy. We need to inform the public about the census's scope, purpose, and process while addressing privacy and confidentiality concerns and those fear of repercussions. And we need to engage the trusted voices to attempt to address trust-based concerns, especially among the most skeptical and disaffected. Next slide, please. Once we figured out what motivated and discouraged people about self-responding to the census, we then needed to determine the best messaging to reach everyone. Now our 2020 campaign is unique in that we just don't target a specific group of, of consumers. So if you think about Coke or Pepsi, they're reaching out to a very specific target audience. We much, must reach and motivate everyone across a very diverse United States. So to begin, Census selected three ideas that would work for us as a federal government agency. We then put those three ideas into a testing process called QUIPT, or Quick Ideas Platform Testing. This consisted of an online panel that had 1,800 subjects, including 400 that we identify as hard to count, 18 focus groups in nine cities, and 10 community representative reviews. This all took place over a seven-day period. Our research team was tired. But in the end, the campaign theme we selected for 2020, you can see here, is shape your future, start here. Next slide, please. So let's talk, par talk partnerships for a bit. We have three legs to our integrated partnership program. We have our national partnership program, our community partnership engagement program, and our census open innovation lab program. Now, we all know we're more likely to trust, respond, or complete a call to action from that trusted voice. Our National Partnership Program wants to tap into those trusted voices from national organizations to raise awareness of the 2020 Census and the work the Census Bureau is doing. So at a national level, 
We want to leverage those current relationships that we have and build new relationships to help us direct messaging and build our brand awareness. We need to organize activities and events that we will promote through our social and digital engagement. And in order to increase response rates, data use and feedback and advocacy, we really need the help of those partners with national reach. Next slide. But not all partners have national scope and reach. This is where our Community Partnership and Engagement Program or CPEP comes in. CPEP aims to develop partnerships with those organizations, groups, and businesses that are more regional or local in scope. Their three goals are to educate people about the 2020 census to, and to foster that communication with the census takers or enumerators when they're out there. They want to encourage community partners to help motivate people to respond. And we need to engage grassroots organizations to help us reach out to those hard to count groups and those who are not gonna be motivated to respond to our national campaign. Next slide. Our Census Open Innovation Labs is a nimble startup-like team within the United States Census Bureau that is setting a standard for open innovation across government. So COIL, as we call them, works closely with tech, media, and entertainment industries, along with federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, and others with two, toward two main goals. They want to increase the American prosperity through open federal data and increase response rates for the 2020 census, particularly among hard to count communities. Through their create a COIL is able to connect content creators with content distributors to help us get the word out about the importance of the census. Next slide. Now let's move into our communications part of the IPC. One of the first areas we need to get the word out about is our recruiting effort. Right now, we're trying to hire hundreds of thousands of people across the country to become our census takers next spring and summer. These are great paying, flexible part-time jobs that allow you to take a valuable role in shaping your community for the next 10 years. For more information on these jobs, you can go to the 2020census.gov slash jobs website. And we're really asking all of our partners to help us share this information with anyone who might be interested. These are great second jobs to get some more income. They're great for college kids who are gonna be home for the summer and looking for something to do. And they're even great for retirees who are just looking for something to fill up their days. Next slide, please. As part of our communications efforts, we also offer our widely popular Statistics in Schools program. This program teaches school children the importance of the census in the hope that they will take that information home to their parents. The heart of our program are the standards-based activities that use census data. This resource created for teachers by teachers is intended to supplement the existing lesson plans in the classroom. We offer free resources and activities for grades pre-K through 12, and they cover subjects through English, social studies, geography, math, and sociology. If you want to access existing resources, sign up for updates, or just check out the really cool materials on the screen, you're seeing some screenshots of our pre-K coloring book, you can go to census.gov slash schools. Next slide. We're also in the process of developing numerous promotional and outreach materials in English and the 12 non-English languages that the response instrument will be available in. These materials include infographics, posters, brochures, and the like that cover all aspects of our 2020 census. If you go to 2020census.gov slash partners and look for our outreach materials, you'll see pages and pages. You can filter on by language or by topic to drill down to what really interests you. We cover from how we conduct the census to the importance of the mm. census to how census data are used. And then what you can expect as we move forward from now through the census time period. Next slide. We also have been very busy developing our public relations, social media, events, and crisis communication efforts 
including our presentations of best practices on crisis communications. We have various sessions to develop campaign key messaging, and we have to develop a crisis communications plan. Our public relations strategy helps drive our education and awareness efforts, particularly among those hard to count audiences. Crisis preparedness and communications will be more important than ever because information now is spreading faster in this new digital environment. And our social media, which is really amped up for 2020, offers us a unique opportunity to personally engage with the public. We're leveraging existing census channels and developing innovative approaches to promote recruiting efforts, enhance customer service, support digital and on the ground events, raise awareness, drive response, and disseminate data. I highly recommend if you don't follow Census on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, you should. We have some really cool stuff that we're putting out every single day. Next slide, please. We also have a beautiful new 2020 census.gov. So we take a mobile first approach to developing our web properties that support our campaign. We use dynamic content so we can tailor the experience for audiences and adjust our approaches as the campaign data become available. So if you haven't already, please take some time, go to 2020census.gov, check it out, poke around, you can, you'll see that there's information for partners, for educators, news and events. We literally cover everything from A to Z and we're adding more and more as we move along. Now this version of the site was launched on August 30th and really includes those updates to align with the creative campaign of Shape Your Future, Start Here. Next slide. Now I'm gonna move into one operation that you will probably see come 2020. We have this new operation that we're developing called the Mobile Response Initiative. This is in response to Congress's joint explanatory statement for 2019 appropriations that really wanted us to get out into the field. In 2010, we provided something that we called Be Counted Centers. And this is where people who didn't receive a paper questionnaire in the mail could go and pick one up. But in 2010, the only way to respond was by mail. So they had to take that form home with them, fill it out, and then get it back into the mail. But 2020, our responses, we will have response assistants out in the field. There will be about 4,700 of them across the country, and they are able to go dynamically to areas where response is lacking. They're gonna have tablets with them, so people can respond right on that census-provided tablet, which is safe and secure, or if they're not comfortable doing that, they can show people how to respond via their own mobile device or assist them in calling our census questionnaire assistance or our phone response option. Next slide. Now, because of the extraordinary level of funding allocated by states and localities for census activities, we expect many partners are going to want to set up their own partner run questionnaire assistance centers. In general, we're, we're cool with that. They can do it a couple of ways. They can help us by suggesting where we should set up mobile questionnaire assistance centers. They can invite our Mobile Questionnaire Assistance Center representatives to visit those partner ones, and they can work as a team. And they can help us by suggesting events. Are there any festivals? Are there any local community gatherings where they think a Mobile Questionnaire Assistance representative could be helpful? Next slide. So here you can see our major milestones for 2019. Right now, we are in the midst of creating and reviewing all of our paid media. So the television and radio commercials you're going to see and hear, the billboards on the sides of the road, posters you'll see in stores, all that, and all of our digital advertising that you'll see when you're online cruising the web. Now, come the end of February and March, you'll be seeing a lot of these census ads, so we need you to be on the lookout for those. We're excited for them. Next slide. So while I can't show you any of those final commercials because we're literally still reviewing and approving and editing, I do want to share with you a video that we created for our one year out celebration this past April. 
this video is a good example of the inspirational and motivational feel you're going to get from the larger body of materials you'll see this spring. So Amy, if you don't mind pressing play on that. Girl in a small town, an architect in a major city, and a suburban high school coach shape the like future of the Yes, they we're can. hearing the video, but we're not seeing it go. That power, you can shape your future. Okay. Maybe try to make it full screen. Can you see the video now? Yes. We can spit over. Thank you. Can one girl in a small town, an architect in a major city, and a suburban high school coach shape the future of the United States? Yes, they can. Because every 10 years, the census gives us that power. You can shape your future by responding to the 2020 census. Where do we need new roads to make our lives easier? Where will new school programs help our children thrive? Where could a new health plan benefit neighborhoods? The 2020 census will inform these decisions and shape how billions of dollars will be distributed to communities like yours each year. And in 2020, you can respond to the census online, by phone, or by mail. It's easy, safe, and important. Make sure you and everyone you know is counted. Now is the time for you to get involved. Your community needs you. Together, we can educate and excite, inspire and make sure every voice is heard. Together, we can shape our future. Thank you. I'm going to reshare the presentation. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, you want to go to the next slide? Trying. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. I think. Kale, I think that's the end of your presentation. Um, it was just the connect with us slide, which showed you how to connect on social media and follow us on Facebook with our email. So not a big deal, but that I was the bulk of mine. End, so we'll okay. end with that. How's that? That sounds, that sounds perfect. So thank you okay. for having me. Well, thank you. You had a wealth of information. It was really, really helpful. Um, Ted and Donna, it's your turn to jump in and, and educate us. So. Definitely, same as we said last time, not, not as interesting as what uh, was presented by Kaylee there, but um, I know it's um, definitely a hot topic for a lot of landlords and members of the NAA in terms of what needs to be disclosed. And we oftentimes get calls from our clients letting us know that uh, tenants have a serious concern of their privacy and uh, their personal information being um, relayed to census workers. That being said, um, we recognize, and from our perspective, there's a lot of benefits. And the reason why this slide is meant to show that they far outweigh uh, compliant, uh, not complying. Compliance is the way that we definitely wanna go and try and to an extent uh, make it exciting for the residents, but also let them know ahead of time that it's coming and what we intend to do, what we're required to do, but also to um, maybe even promote the census, as Kaylee indicated, with literature, posters, advertising, building link, I know is a, uh, an item that a lot of clients have available to them with their residents, letting them know that the census is coming and to just put them uh, on notice that um, this information is gonna be shared and that we are gonna comply with our obligations under uh, federal law in terms of disclosure. And what is required for disclosure is to provide the names of occupants and the number of occupants in the unit. That's the information that you need to provide. 
in terms of access, you need to provide access to the building, uh, not to the individual apartments, but to the building. And um, those are the main requirements that you have as an owner. Uh, it's all found under uh, the section of the code, which is 13 US code section 223. Uh, if anybody wants to go and look at it, uh, we've provided and there is available uh, to all the members some frequently asked questions regarding the census from a landlord's perspective in terms of obviously what the benefits are, which were discussed a little bit today in terms of uh, federal funding that comes to housing and uh, also just um, distributing the electoral votes for elections. Um, now, the uh, egress which you're required to provide, and that's the language that's used in the, in the code, is to and from the building, as I indicated earlier. Um, so we do need to provide access to these officials when we say officials and these representatives from the census, these are individuals who provide you with a copy of their badge, which should have the United States Department of Commerce Bureau of the Census emblem on it. And it should also have a picture ID so we know that the person there is an actual employee for the census. Um, that brings into question a lot of times when you might get an email or you might get uh, a telephone call from a census worker indicating that they want this information and would prefer obviously not to come down to obtain that information from you. And um, in those situations, again, photographic evidence is uh, necessary. So we do advise clients to ensure that they do have the proper identification provided to them before disclosing any of that information. Um, now, there is a penalty that's involved if you do not comply. And that penalty is $500 per offense. Maybe you wanna click the next slide. Yeah, are we on the next one for the yeah. offense? Yeah, sorry about that. So the penalty is the $500 per offense. So that can become very costly to the extent that you're considering each failure or each refusal to provide access or provide the information that's being requested. Um, it's not a criminal violation, it is a civil penalty. So you do have to pay those amounts to the extent that you're gonna be cited and you haven't complied. Um, so that's, extremely important for you to know in terms of what you're obligated to do and what the ramifications are. So I guess we can go to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, and as Ted said, the next slide is about what, what is a duly accredited representative. Uh, we always want to see some sort of identification, have the correct seal on it. Um, the, there's a copy of what the seal should look like on the bottom of the slide. Um, and you want to make sure to um, properly um, ask for this information and that everybody has that and I believe that they need to wear it while they're in the building um, conducting their work as well. So um, that's important too. And then the next frequently asked question page. Uh, all of the, um, the next frequently asked question is um, what sections in the lease allow you to comply? And although every NA lease is different, um, state specific, there is typical language which states that uh, we are allowed to disclose this information for law enforcement um, or governmental purposes. And that's exactly what the census is part of um, besides the requirement under federal law. So we do put in the lease that tenants should be on notice that this is something that we would be uh, responding to. Again, you can assure your tenants though um, that we're not um, providing any uh, personal information that is beyond uh, what is required to be disclosed um, by the regulations. And, and most people I think are going to realize that it's something that happens every 10 years and they've all been through it before and know that that's um, something that needs to happen in terms of getting funding for um, from the federal government for different programs. And usually people are happy to uh, understand that that's just a necessary, a necessary uh, exercise. And then the last slide. Yeah. So some of the key legal takeaways and um, the going back for a quick second, we have the required information. That's the names of the occupants. 
So to the extent that any residents are concerned about what other information is being provided, that's really all we're providing is the names of the occupants and how many occupants are in each one of the apartments uh, that we are managing or own. Um, but from a illegal takeaways perspective, certainly the benefits outweigh the concerns. Partnering up with uh, census workers and the initiatives here is definitely in landlords' uh, best interests and residents should understand that and hopefully again with uh, some of the advertising that goes up and potentially informing your residents about the fact that it's coming and also I know we've talked about some clients that actually have considered hosting parties for the census just to inform some of their residents about what they're going to be doing. Because we'd uh, rather ha have them uh, self-report um, than have to put it on the burden of landlords or management agents to to do the reporting so we want to encourage all of the tenants to to do the self-reporting and making it easier for them to do that is obviously part of the key yeah and um again it's a civil penalty it's not a criminal penalty but it can become expensive to the extent that you're uh, they're considering each offense a 500 dollar uh, violation so um that middle section what does it require we've gone over it a bunch now it's access to the building not to the individual apartments you should absolutely not be opening up doors uh, it's at that point the census workers um, duty to knock on doors and try and get that information directly if necessary uh, the names of the persons and the number of persons occupying in person is definitely suggested recommended highly urged phone disclosures should typically be shied away from you don't have a copy of that badge or the person's identification in order to disclose that information so you do have some due diligence you need to do on your end to ensure that the person that is uh, trying to get this information is who they say they are um, how to respond to the residents. We've identified for you the disclosure rights section, which should be in every lease uh, that the NAA puts out for um, various states. And we provided you the language uh, in one of the slides that comes out of the Massachusetts section, which is if somebody requests that information, you allow us to, and, and you, uh, we have the ability to disclose it to the extent that it's necessary uh, for governmental purposes. So that's it. That's all we got. And um, there was something in the chat. Sure. Yeah. Don't know if there's some questions. Yeah. So um, here, as Kale said earlier, here's her slide, which um, shows everyone how to connect with the uh, Census 2020 teams. Um, and then uh, Ted and Donna were nice enough to put together a frequently asked questions page um, for us as well. And all of this information can be found on NAA's. Uh, web page dedicated to um, our partnership with the 2020 census. So um, we hope that we've answered um, any question that you may have had as you came into this workshop. Um, I am recording this and this will also be placed on our web page as well. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can use the chat box that's provided here on the webinar. Um, Paul, thank you for the compliment and um, just chime in now. We'll give everybody a minute to type any questions that we may not have addressed. Um, I'm not seeing any come through, which means Ted, Donna, and Kale did an awesome job. So that tells us that we're good to go, but um, I can be reached here at NAA as well um, for anybody that has any further follow-up. So thank you everyone um, for your time today and Ted, Donna, Kale, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a much. great day. Bye.